This is Marketing Fundamentals with Bob. Topic 15, Advertising, Publicity, and PR. Well, as we have seen, folks, to be successful, any product or service has got to have a competitive advantage other than price. I've got either unique features and benefits that are worth paying for and or special positioning in the mind of the customer, but that's not enough. You know, you heard the phrase, uh, build a better mousetrap and the world will be the path to your door. Well, maybe it will, maybe it won't. Um, prospective customers better find out about it and then also uh, they better have it available when and where they are ready to buy. And hence, our fourth and last P, promotion and the promo mix. So we have in, in promotion, we have advertising, PR, publicity, personal selling, sales promotion, and today what we're going to do is in topic 15 here, we'll cover advertising, PR, publicity, and then in prop topic 16, we'll do personal selling, sales promotion. So quick overview of all these guys. Advertising, um, marketer paid, uh, com communication about uh, product, service, organization. Traditionally what that has meant has been an impersonal one-way mass communication like uh, radio, TV, newspaper, yellow pages, outdoor, something like that. Interesting to note, early internet advertising uh, was basically impersonal one-way mass communication. They just p patch it up against everybody up there. Just kind of like um, the early days of television really was basically just radio with pictures. Uh, today, whole, whole new game. You must also, and perhaps even exclusively, create a presence so that prospects find you when they're searching for information online or your icon appears where they're most likely to click on it. So on Facebook, they want you to click on it that you might be interested and they think they know something about you that makes you want to be inclined to click on it. It's very interesting to me. I was, um, I've was i been noticing on a regular ongoing basis. I, I'm checking out the radar at weather.com and on a regular basis, there's an ad that appears there about there's single women in their 50s might be interested in meeting you. And I'm thinking, how, how do these people know I'm old? Uh, <clears throat> what do they get it from? How do they have any profile on me out there? And, and I was talking to one of my, pro one of my colleagues and say, <clears throat> how would they know this? And he says to me, Bob, what uh, websites do you frequent? And I said, well, I'm, my homepage is MSN Money, and then I go to CNN, the Weather Channel, and I might occasionally go to ABC News. And he just looks at me and says, yeah, Bob, and, and, and I go, oh, yeah, I guess so. So I guess that's the way it is. PR publicity, um, basically uh, PR being the management of the publicity that the organization receives. Good example of that, CNN. Uh, running a feature story about a, a company and its employees who are uh, volunteering to work with kids in inner city schools. That's nice. Bad example. How about those recent stories of managers and financial services organizations getting super, super rich as customers, stockholders, and the uh, taxpayers go broke? Or closer to home, how do you spell BP? Dubious example of this, I was watching a, uh, a, a commercial recently for Fancy Feast Cat Food and at the tag at the end of the thing says, the Fancy Feast cat may soon be appearing in your area. Check your local paper for details. And I'm thinking, the Fancy Feast cat, who on earth is going to care about going to see the Fancy Feast cat? And then it sort of dawned on me, <clears throat> what if you live in Pace? Um, in Pace, where the, the biggest event of the week is Thursday night, when people get down to watch the Winn-Dixie truck unload. That's about it there. Uh, today, viral videos. Can I create something wild and crazy? Almost any publicity is good publicity. Now, as we noted, topic 16 is going to cover uh, sales promotion, incentives to consumers or the trade to create a, key point, short-term incentive to buy, and then personal selling, direct one-on-one -on -one communication between marketers and prospects. So let's look at some of the factors that influence the promo mix. And we've got the type of product, that's simple enough, uh, closely related to the nature of the target market. If I've got a, um, a routine purchase, limited risk and consequences, wide target market, I'm going to be looking at advertising, sales promotion, intense distribution. Uh, infrequent purchase, higher risk and consequences, customized products, B2B, uh, certainly going to go heavy on, on personal selling. And certainly the, the amount of my funds I have available will influence what my options can be. But absolutely positively, the most important factor that's going to introduce 
uh, that's going to affect what, what you're going to do as far as your promo mix is concerned, and I need a drum roll for this, please, is the product life cycle. So let's look at the promo mix and the product life cycle. <clears throat> a lot of implications here what your strategy is going to be. Intro stage of the PLC. I'm going with high levels of advertising to gain awareness and trial. Here, we kind of talked about some of these things on, uh, on how we do, do advertising and promo. This is informative advertising. I'm doing um, primary demand here if and only if I'm first in the category. Now, I'm, I must then persuade that secondary demand um, if I'm a latecomer in an already established category. When I get to the growth stage of the uh, PLC, I'm fighting out for market share now. That's persuasive advertising by my brand at that point. Early in the, uh, in the growth stage, I may reduce my sales promotion a little bit. I gotta make some money. I'm trying to increase my profits from some of my brand loyal customers out there. Latter stages of the growth stage, not much growth now. And so at this point here, I've got more sales promotion. I gotta defend my turf and take share away from the competition because the reality is I'm not getting growth anymore uh, the pie is no longer expanding. I've got to take it away from the other guy. Uh, maturity into early decline stages. I can use reminder advertising if I'm a master brand or I got a cash cow with a core group of loyal users. So all I have to do is remind people there's always room for jello. Or uh, an old example, all I have to do is remind you about taking pictures and you'll think about Kodak. It was interesting in the uh, Pickles comic strip uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, the old lady, is she's saying to her grandson about this is a Kodak moment, and the kid says, what's a Kodak? Yeah, well, that's what happens when the market leaves you by. But the old days, that's all Kodak had to do. Do keep in mind, you divest the whole thing when the cash cow becomes a dog. Now, note on this thing. There's a point of diminishing returns. Hell, there's a point of decreasing returns on advertising after I've seen that fitness video 40 times. I'm probably less inclined to buy it than I ever was in the first place. Also, here's the thing. Ad cost is the same for a five share brand as it is a, for a 50 share brand, but that means for the five share brand it's 10 times the cost per case, which means basically that high share brands are going to spend proportionally less on advertising. And frankly, for a smaller share brand, it's not feasible to go head to head with the big boys in the ad wars, compounded by the fact that the trade has got the power to demand and get um, trade allowances from small share brands. I'll get into more of that thing in some detail on that when I get into uh, in topic 16. So let's look at some of the major types of advertising that we are dealing with. And we have in this institutional advertising. Uh, I'm out there to promote the company image. Uh, hopefully now, I'm promoting your company image, you're gonna do this for free through uh, PR as a news story. Or I'm promoting a product class. Oh, I think one of the, uh, one of the greatest uh, campaigns of all time, Got Milk. <clears throat> it's got, whatever it is, you know it's milk back there. I've seen a, it's a bumper sticker, Got Jesus. It's still, you think, Got Milk, and it's a great idea in a campaign there. Or you have advocacy advertising to advocate a position. It's interesting on the cigarette companies now, trying to sort of <clears throat> defend smokers' rights and all that. Um, and of course, it's you know, Florida, one of the few states left now that you can still smoke in bars and probably not for all that long. Um, I've been saying for some time that I really sort of think the cigarette companies are, are gonna be awfully concerned about not letting people smoke in a car with a child in it. Hey, California's done it. You cannot smoke in a car when you have a child in the car, which is fair. In fact, I was, um, I was pulling in the Winn-Dixie parking lot a few weeks back and uh, just another car, a van pulls up, and here's a lady just puffing away in a cigarette. She's got about a three-year-old in the car. I was really tempted to, uh, as, as she's walking in the store, to say, ma'am, you just really shouldn't be doing that with a child in your car. Uh, <clears throat> but I didn't. I, I'm the more sensitive Bob now. Anyhow, um, I think cigarette companies are also scared to death that there's gonna have uh, legislation making it illegal to smoke in your home with a child in, in, in the house like that. That'll be interesting in Minneapolis in the middle of the winter time. And uh, people may say, well, that, wait a second, this is my home. Well, well, wait a second, you can't sexually abuse them in your home. The, the question can be, can you physically abuse them by smoking in the home? And so the cigarette companies are trying to defend smokers' rights and all that. Um, yeah, we'll just see how that works out. But I, I, something I have a whole lot more sympathy with is the insurance companies who basically are looking at, we got 
50 states with 50 sets of laws defining insurance, we really need a national program so it makes it much simpler. Okay, that's advocacy advertising. That makes some sense on this. Product advertising, which you really think about more often when you get into, in, into advertising, addressing a specific uh, product or service. And it, but it may not address the, uh, the product itself or its benefits. We'll get more of that thing later on. Um, within this, we have the direct advertising, uh, direct action advertising, which seeks uh, immediate action overall. Um, an 800 number on an infomercial, yellow pages, catalog, uh, point of purchase, which is really promo advertising, or uh, an e-tailer's in internet site. Indirect advertising is what you really think of more often than not uh, on advertising. Building the image, building the positioning, the long-term awareness and loyalty. So I see, I see a traditional 30-second spot on network TV uh, or something like this thing here. Uh, uh, basically, I, 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 I probably am, am not going to go running out to buy the product just like that. I see a Bud Light ad, I don't head out to the Homestead Saloon. The effect is later at the, at the, at the point of encounter. So within this, we have the pioneering advertising. Uh, that's my primary demand. And then here, I'm trying to say, try something new. That's my informative advertising. Intro stage of the PLC, you see all the stuff here tying together here. Uh, or I could have a, um, a basically a new product which represents a significant improvement or a breakthrough from an existing category. Um, the Apple iPad, the product wasn't totally new, but it's a, it's a breakthrough in the category. But the Apple iPad, uh, how much of that stuff, uh, I would ask, was, uh, was paid advertising versus free publicity as a news story? Apple's been pretty good about that. Competitive advertising, that's your secondary demand. Buy my brand, that's the persuasive advertising. Now, here's the thing. Very possibly there are a few, if any, tangible product differences. So what I'm going to do is, is most likely and most effectively differentiate uh, based upon positioning and my AIOs. Um, comparative advertising, that's us versus them. Very interesting on this. Prior to 1971, you couldn't do comparative advertising at all. Uh, you could not advertise against another brand or even a product class. In the old days, the, the margarine companies would talk about uh, the taste versus the high price spread. They couldn't say bar. They couldn't, um, couldn't even imagine a brand called I Can't Believe It's Not Butter as a brand. Couldn't even do it. Uh, in those days, it was, the lobby wouldn't let, you, wouldn't let you get there. It was very intriguing driving out of Illinois into Wisconsin. In Wisconsin at the time, America's Dairyland, you could not sell margarine in, uh, in, in little quarter pound blocks. No, no, no. It was only available uncolored in big tubs. So driving out of Illinois on 90 or 94, you'd see these signs just before the border, oleo, so people go by and get their oleo margarine in, in uh, quarter pound sticks. It's like fireworks signs in a lot of states here. Today, ho, oh, it's wide open. Uh, we can compare, compress my brand versus somebody else's brand. Uh, hey, 70% of the customers prefer the taste of my product versus the taste of this product, or I'll go on and, and compare on tangibles and intangibles. I'll say, we talked about Pepsi. Pepsi says, uh, hey, Pepsi, you're young and cool. Coke, you're old and nerdy. How about politics? Um, it's very interesting on the, on the political campaign. I was uh, very interested, very, found it very interesting in the, in the most recent presidential campaign where one of the candidates, uh, his, his, whole, his whole line of thing, I suck, but my competitor's worse. You just say basically, this is, this is I ba I'm basically this person, I, I'm comparing myself to the other person here. Now, Within this, let's take a look at some of the creative decisions to get involved in advertising, because this is, uh, there's a little difference here in what happens uh, by the book and what really happens in the, in the real world. One thing we would say, determine campaign objectives, absolutely positively, not a question about that. That's the first thing you're going to do in campaign is determine campaign objectives for which we have the acronym, acronym DAGMAR, defining advertising goals for measured advertising results. So for instance, I would say, I want 66% of my target market to be aware. Uh, I have unaided recall for this new product in an internet-based campaign uh, and survey conducted uh, 90 days after campaign launch. That will define for you quantitatively what you're trying to accomplish. Now note on this, your measurement on ad goals is on ad awareness only. Now I've, I've been in meetings with the ad guys and uh, I've had them say, well, ad awareness is nice. We want sales. And the ad guys are coming back and saying, uh, we can't talk sales. We don't know what's going to happen with sales. All we can talk about is ad awareness. But that's okay. 
There's so many other factors in there. There's your deal levels, promotion, distribution, all sorts of other factors come in there, and advertising can't control all the other factors. So fine, advertising gets me awareness. That's what I'm trying to do. Then we get into the thing about the creative decisions. Okay, the old school says, I start with the advertising appeal, AKA the unique selling proposition, or in the trade we call it the CPC, commercial positioning concept. That's a phrase which ties directly to your positioning and your differential advantage. So when I say, less filling tastes great, you say, Miller Lite. And I say, good to the last drop, Maxwell House. Or don't leave home without it, American Express. See, American Express is saying, your Visa MasterCard is fine all around town, but when you're overseas, if you have issues, you have problems, you need the American Express office, so they position it that way. But anyhow, you start off with the CPC, then you do the execution, which communicates the appeal. And I was in my, in my orals in my PhD program at Georgia, and we got into this discussion here and saying, well, you can't start with execution. And I made the observation that companies routinely start with execution. And, and it, you, you ever been in a situation where, say, you're dealing with a cop, and you know this is what they want you to say. So you bet, damn well better say it. So okay, I thought I said, yeah, you're right. You can't start with execution. You gotta start with the CPC and then go to execution. The reality is people, today you might start with execution and never address your differential advantage even if you have one in the first place. Oh, I wish I had been a fly on the wall in St. Louis when Augie Bush IV was hearing for the new campaign for Budweiser. And it was sort of like, okay, Mr. Bush, are you ready to hear the new campaign? Yeah, okay, let's go get these guys. You know, they bring them in, and they set them up there, and, set them, and, and they say, okay, gentlemen, go ahead. And the guy goes, what's up? And I can imagine Mr. Bush was sitting in the audience saying, yeah, yeah, please have them continue. And the guy said, and, and the, the ad guy says, no, Mr. Bush, that's the campaign. That's the whole campaign. What would your reaction have been if you're Augie Bush for? you might think, oh my God, this is awful. Hey people, everyone knew that line. And here's the, what's the genius about it. Everybody knows it's Budweiser. How? I can see it's cute. It's really cute on this thing about the was up. How is it that everyone knew that was associated with Budweiser? I don't know. I don't know how they did it. And, and think about what they're trying to do in their target market. That's all they're trying to do is get you to think Budweiser. That's the whole advertising is trying to do. Think about Budweiser. Um, and I was like, like thinking about what age group are they trying to get brand preference for Budweiser? 12. I would say 12. You figure kids don't start drinking until they say 13, 14, something like that. But at 12. At 12, you want them already thinking about, when, they, when I think beer, I think Budweiser. So when they grow up, they're gonna be Bud drinkers. In fact, I was out doing the run. I was going, um, I was going southbound on Stefani and I made a, a left turn to turn east on nine and a half mile road. And I, tur I turned the corner there and, and I saw on the side there what appeared to be uh, four about 10 year old boys playing basketball. Well, I've learned in combat as well as in my neighborhood that you better not assume that what you're seeing is, is, is 10 year old boys playing basketball. It might, be, uh, it might be a terrorist group that's setting up a diversion and they're, they're, gonna, they're gonna basically unleash fire on you. But no, I, this was it, was, it appeared to be what it was, um, 10 year old boys playing basketball. And I'm just running by there and one of them kind of looks at me and goes, what's up? And I'm thinking, Holy mackerel, Augie Bush for I guess I hope you're really proud of yourself. You got ten year old boys that are saying, What's up? You bet that's exactly what they're trying to say. That's all they're trying to do with that ad campaign. Now, if you do have a um, a differ differential advantage, you might do a demonstration. I spray on my tile cleaner and clean it off. Gee, that's great. I might do it a comparison. Is my brand the other brand? That'll work. Uh, or employ a slice of life. A neighbor drops in, she just walks into somebody's kitchen, and, oh Mrs. Olson. I in my neighborhood, you just walk into somebody's kitchen, just like that, unannounced, boom, you're gone. But anyhow, 
she just, she just walks, oh, Mrs. Olsen, and all this, and they're, they're talking about, oh, the streaky windows, and then you see another little scene later, the lighting's a little different, their outfit's a little different, and they're talking about how Windex has uh, cleaned the windows and saved the marriage. Um, and of course, as we've noted in this thing here, um, prestige, image, uh, lifestyle, sex appeal as points of positioning on, uh, on intangibles. So let's take a note of some of the, uh, the major advertising media that we deal with oh, oh, on this thing. Consider your objectives, folks. If you want to reach a wide, uh, diverse audience, I'm going to go with network TV, magazines like Time, Newsweek, People. By contrast, if you're looking at a, a more narrow, specialized audience, specialty cable channels like Golf Network, magazines like American Rifleman, Fitness, something like that. But today, guys, no, no. You go way beyond the, uh, the traditional media. Customers seeking information when they're ready to buy, they got to find you when you do a Google search. They got to find you right there. I do a whole lot more of that in my professional selling and sales management classes. You certainly cannot rely just on radio TV. You can forget newspapers and the yellow pages. Now, here's, let's, let's think about some of these things here. About um, considering a Super Bowl ad versus, um, say, a YouTube viral video. Super Bowl ad is going to run you about um, $3 million for a 30 second spot. Let's consider a viral, uh, viral video. Let's try the one about Mentos mints and uh, Diet Coke. you have any idea what happens when you take 500 Mentos mints and drop them into a 200 liters of Diet Coke? It gives you an explosion that would, 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 would looks like uh, old faithful geyser going off like this. Here goes off this, this viral video on this with Mentos mints. Here's all this publicity, people seeing Mentos mints. Mentos just rides the wave. Everybody's talking about Mentos mints. Diet Coke, the people at Coca-Cola, oh, oh, oh. For, for the people at, at, at Coca-Cola, it was like they put a turd under their nose. It was, oh, no, that is not consistent with our, our image and positioning of Diet Coke. Are you kidding me? It's free publicity. The cost of that Super Bowl ad, I can take four or five wild and crazy people, put them in my marketing department, create some kind of viral video doing something wild and crazy like this, what do they got to do? Could they come up with one wild and crazy YouTube video every two years? That would pay their salary in space. I could pay them six-figure salaries and it would pay it off. And isn't that a whole lot more useful than $3 million in a 30-second spot on the Super Bowl? I think so. Um, as we've noted, we've got uh, targeted click opportunities. We'll talk about that. And then product placements today. Um, James Bond did not just happen to be riding a BMW motorcycle. Now, again, this is one, this product placements is getting a, a little bit passe now. I noticed in, in one case, there's a new movie coming out. They were taking 50 different product placements. Too much. Too much. If you're just one of, the, one of those people in the product placements, it gets old. You see a movie, you don't notice it. You got to be more subtle in a product placement. Um, Gatorade cups and coolers, you notice them on the sidelines. You can't miss that orange cooler. You see the cups, you know what they are. You know at the end of the game, when the game's almost won, the Gatorade goes over the top, on top of the coach. You're thinking Gatorade, buddy. You're thinking that that's exactly what they're trying to do. Now, let's kind of consider this. Go back to the Super Bowl here again. Um, you got $3 million for a 30-second spot. What do you, you put on a 30-second spot every quarter, that's $12 million. What do you think it's going to cost you, just out of curiosity, to have your Gatorade cooler and cups on the sidelines? What do you think it's going to, they're going to charge you for that? I'll bring it back to the question. What do you think would be more effective having a 30-second spot every quarter or having the cooler and the cups on the sidelines and having the product going over the coach's head. If you agree, as I would tend to think would be the case, that having the cooler and the cups and the Gatorade going over the coach would be at least as effective as a 30-second spot every quarter, then we're going to charge you $12 million to have your cooler and cups on the sidelines. Yes, that's what it's worth. And that's what a company would be willing to pay for it. Clever one that I see. You know, the, the Aflac Duck, know that one? There's a couple ads. The Aflac Duck is in a supermarket. 
And it's, in one case, it's got a wall of Wheaties behind it. Another one, it's got a wall of Downy Fabric Softener. The wall of Wheaties is amazing. It, it's, got, it's got about 20 facings wide and about eight facing, facings high. It's just solid Wheaties back there. The duck's going on and carrying on and all the stuff like this, and then the walls all fall over like this. So anyhow, it's an Aflac ad. But you see the product placement for the Wheaties there. Now, what do you think? Would you say that that product placement of that whole wall of Wheaties is about, say, at least half as effective as would be an ad just for Wheaties? If that's the case, then we could probably get General Mills to pay half the cost of the commercial, which means people, if they were running that commercial on an ad campaign and we're going to spend $10 million on the ad campaign, General Mills pays $5 million of it. On the other side of it, the one on Downey Fabric Softener, they pay $5 million out of a $10 million on it, which means you just put, if each of those campaigns were, say, $10 million each, $20 million total, and somebody else paid a total of $10 million of that, you just put $10 million on your company's bottom line. How many great ideas do you think you have to have like that to basically make it in marketing today in the creative area of the business? Maybe one in your career, that's the key, folks. Now, here's a product placement, just a unique idea. Come up with something today on this. Can you come up? Can you be the person in that organization that creates that viral video, that creates that real key product placement that you can use and get some partner to pay a very significant part of that ad cost? Because I'm sure it did not take any effectiveness away from that Aflac duck. Think about that for some of those ideas, because that's topic 15, and this is Marketing Fundamentals with Bob.